you were just here. I'm Tim Grieving, and I'm sorry, or you're welcome, that I'm back. Um, I'm a journalist who writes about film music, if you weren't here. But you're not, I'm not the reason you're here. These two guys are. Um, let me bring on director David Lowry. And his trusty composer, Daniel Hart. Gentlemen, welcome. I'm welcoming you to a place that I don't live, but. Um, I'll take it. <laughs> David, is this a new outfit that you're wearing? There's a, there's a part of a, a joke that I will explain to you later. Ah, oh, yes. A little secret joke. Yeah. Well, since we're starting with um, appearances, I, had to, I want to ask you do you shave your own head? I do. Every day? Like every two to three days. Okay. See, I'm too lazy to do it, but. It's so much faster than going somewhere to have it done. Who, uh, no, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to keep <laughs> talking about your appearance. Um, well, I'm very excited for this. Uh, you guys have built a very, uh, in, a, in a short period of time, built a really amazing body of work together that, you know, I think we can already see certain themes emerging, narrative themes, aesthetic themes. So it's exciting to kind of do a little retrospective here and see how they all link together. And as I was watching your movies uh, preparing for this, it struck me, and maybe this isn't profound or it's already been pointed out, but I feel like your films find the myth in the ordinary and the everyday, and they find the ordinary and the everyday in the myth. Because you've obviously dealt with some very kind of normal human stories, um, but then also kind of grand, poetic, uh, fantastical stories. Um, I don't know if you think that's fair, but I do, if it's true, I think Daniel also plays a huge part in the mythic part of that. I think that's a fair way to describe it. When I, we showed, um, the old man, the gun in Toronto at the film festival there. And so the Cameron Bailey like introduced and I was like, all the, all of these movies that David makes feel like bedtime stories. And I was like, oh yeah, that's a great way to describe it. Um, and bedtime stories and fairy tales have a lot to do with mythology. So I think that all that all adds up. Well, let's we'll unpack that as we go along. But before we go any further, I want to let you know a special surprise if you don't already know. But at the end of this uh, uh, discussion, you're going to see the world premiere of a brand new short film uh, that David directed and Daniel scored. That's a companion to The Green Knight. Um, first time ever being publicly shown, right? Or yeah, I haven't even I haven't seen, you haven't it, any, seen it on anything other than a, a laptop screen. So this will be crazy. <laughs> so yes, yeah, so very exciting. We'll leave we'll leave room for that, and uh, that's a great way to go out on. So um, now, for the folks who don't know, and I'm not going to make you tell your origin story, but uh, the two of you met. You're both from Texas. Mutual friend, guy you were in a band with. You needed music. Let's move on. <laughs> that's it. That's how you met. That's, um, that's it. Fifteen, seventeen. 20 years ago, something like that? I don't even know. 2008? Yeah. Okay. And what the what was the name of the band you were ending? The Physics of Meaning was the name of my band at the time. It's a terrible name, <laughs> but I don't use it anymore. So if you want to use a terrible band name, it's free. <laughs> and what, what did you respond to in that music that you heard? It was, it was really epic. It had a, a sweep to it that was just uh, instantly just sort of captivating. And so you needed music for your first feature, Saint Nick. Were you looking for some kind of epic music? I didn't know, as is often the case, I didn't know what I was looking for. It's, I, I'm, I very often like kind of like realize what it was I was looking for after I've heard it. And, and that was was certainly the case there. I think one of the things that I was really looking for was something that felt, had a strong sense of authorship to it and felt handmade. Because at that point in particular, I really was, I wanted my movies to feel very, very handmade and have the texture of, of a of handmade craftsmanship to it. And that was certainly present in the music I heard from Daniel's band. And Daniel, that was the first time you ever put music to film, right, on St. Nick? Yeah, exactly. Was that something you had wanted to do prior to that? No, I, I had not thought about it at all, never. I just wanted to play in bands and tour and perform concerts. That was my only goal. 
So other than presumably getting along with David, um, what was it about that first experience that turned you on to, to combining music and film and being a film composer? Well, there's, there's something about David's films that draw an immediate response from me in the way that I can watch them. And in the case of St. Nick and many of the other films that we've made, uh, there was no music for, in the film yet. So I was just watching a, a film without any music. And um, usually for me, with David or, or other people, if it, the film itself is something that I connect to in any way, then music just starts showing up in my head while I'm watching, the kind of music that I think should be the score for the film. And, and this was true for St. Nick. I, I just watched, I, I don't think I even finished it before I started writing the music. I just, I like watched the first 20 minutes and I thought, oh, I know, I know this, like this, uh, I immediately connect with this and, and I know the kind of music that I think should be uh, with this story. And you've said before that it was the short film after that pioneer where you really kind of locked into your your collaborative, your shared aesthetic or your working process. Is that right? Yes, because the Saint Nick only has a what ten or fifteen minutes of music in it. Even less, I think like five probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just wrote a couple of short pieces, and I didn't even score the picture. I just I watched it, and then I wrote something. It wasn't for a specific scene. It was just something that felt like the film to me. Um, but Pioneer was actually scored. So I consider that to be my first actual scoring job. This, this relationship between director and composer is so weird, right? Because it's your baby, and you, you, you know the music is important, and you know it's going to help do so many things, and it's going to set the tone, and it's going to probably create an emotional response in the viewer and everything, and you somehow have to communicate that, express the unex inexpressible to somebody else who then has to kind of read your mind or interpret what you said and then come up with music that then fits what you had in mind or improves it maybe. So how did you two find that language or how did you find your process uh, early on? I mean, to set St. Nick aside again, because that wasn't the music wasn't written to picture. I think my memory of, of Pioneer, which that was 12 years ago now, yeah. was I probably had already edited the whole thing or had a rough cut and we just yeah. watched it. And then you sent over some music. We watched it in my tiny apartment in, in Dallas. And I didn't have a car, so I think you picked me up. I think Toby drove you over. Yeah. yeah. And um, Toby is our mutual friend who connected us in yeah. the first place. And uh, and we watched it and then talked about it. Yeah. I don't think you played anything at all. But no. then I was driven back home. <laughs> yes. And uh, and I don't know what the turnaround time was, but then you sent some music, and I think it clicked pretty, right in. Yeah, pretty pretty short turnaround, I think, because again, I watched it and responded to it immediately, and felt like I knew at least some of the music that needed to go with what I had seen. I know. I remember remember you specifically saying you recorded it in the closet. I definitely did some recording in the closet. The apartment that I was in was an apartment in a house. So the house had been split up into four apartments. Um, so I felt like I had to do the score very quietly <laughs> because I didn't want to disturb my neighbors. <laughs> and, so, and I felt like the score needed quite a bit of percussion. Um, but I didn't want to use a drum kit because, again, it's too loud. So I did a lot of um, hand claps and knee slaps and mouth percussion, and I felt like that was the beginning of this continuing motif that we've Indeed. tried to put into every film. So that's the origin of the hand claps? Is that's you, you being in a closet trying not to wake up the neighbors? That's correct. Wow. Yes. A legend was born. <laughs> Um, Daniel, in addition to you being a composer, songwriter, multi-instrumentalist, you also studied playwriting I did. in school. That's my degree, yeah. So how, how much do you think that affects the way you approach writing a score? It, I think it affects everything for me um, because I'm always thinking about the characters and what they want and why they do the things they do and the overall arc of the story and the 
dialogue. I see it on the screen, but I also see it in I see the the script in my head as they're saying it. You know, it's like uh, ingrained in in my brain. I can't turn it off. I always think about the things that I learned as a playwright. Is that helpful for you, David, or do you is it is there too many uh, too many writers in the kitchen sometimes? No, just knowing that <laughs> like on an instinctive level that that's where he's coming from is like it's I mean enviable I can't also play many instruments <laughs> it's pretty you awesome have, you have different instruments I can you pretend I can pretend to play the piano for about 30 seconds and then you realize I don't know what I'm doing you play our heartstrings David ah uh, that's Tim <laughs> Um, so what the theme that we kind of landed on for this talk other than just kind of a, a deep dive into your work is the the moment where you unlock a score and like find your way into a score, which I'm assuming isn't always easy or immediate or happens right at the beginning. Is that fair to say? Yeah, that's fair to say. Or, or I think I found it at the beginning and then I'm wrong and I don't learn that I'm wrong until later. So we're going to show, uh, we're going to walk through a couple, a couple of your films and show a scene that you picked that sort of helps us find how you found your way into it. So yeah. We'll start with your your breakout film, Ain't Them Bodies Saints, which you came here uh, to Ghent after you finished, right? So nine, some of you nine years here. ago. <laughs> That's crazy. Um, I know, indeed. Um, do you want to set up this clip? Um, or I don't know if we need to, but um, the first clip for me. I also haven't sense. seen the movie in nine years, so this is going to be quite an experience. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> this um, this clip features a piece of music called Ruth and Sylvie. And I feel like this was the first piece of music that I sent to you, David, that made you feel like uh, we were on track. And I think that when you sent it to me, we were the the post for this movie was incredibly accelerated. Yeah, you know, we it was probably like nine weeks total. I think so. Yeah. And the um, the moment that you sent this, I just remember being in the edit suite in New York and just like recutting the sequence to this music and then that kind of like paved the way for the rest of them we probably had an assembly at that point already but like yeah very quickly started like reshaping the movie to the music as it went and it became the kind of really the first time where like the score and the edit were progressing hand in hand uh in very close concert let's watch a clip from ain't them body saints Take her home. That was fun to. I forgot that that happened in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> Box of kittens. That's yeah. The best. That yeah. kid is now forty years old. <laughs> <laughs> Both of them. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, Daniel, how many? How much of that cue are you performing yourself? It's about ninety percent. We had a string section come in at the end, like five or six players to uh, augment what I had recorded at home. But I did the strings and the hand claps and the uh, the thing that starts the cue is a, a banjo being played with an ebo, so like an electric magnet, so it makes that buzzy sound. So, uh, how much of this one man band is a budget thing, and how much of it is an aesthetic? desire on your part to have it sound homemade and how much of it is you just showing off that you can do all this stuff <laughs> because this is, this becomes a constant yeah. this is this is a one of the one of the elements of your aesthetic is this kind of textural handmade quality of the music i think more than any of those things i remember when we were doing um pete's dragon and recording an air and I, I can't remember which track it was. It was the saying goodbye where you wanted to play the, the violin yourself. Yeah, I wanted to play one. the violin solo for and that it, one. For speaking personally, just me hearing the soundtrack and watching the movie and knowing that that's you playing it in that makes it so much more impactful to me. And so from, from my perspective, all of the things that you mentioned are true, but it's also just really important to me to know that that's the degree to which you're involved with the score and that 
when you hear those strings, they're 90% of the time you're, you're the one playing them. In this case, the composer is the score by and large, right? That, that, that role is being performed by, by you, so. Yeah, and, and it, is, it has to do with everything that you mentioned. It is a budgetary thing, and it's also a desire to perform because I, came, I was a performer first, and um, I think in those terms. And, um, and self-recording, there's certain things about the way that I played the strings on that track that I could notate on sheet music for someone else, but um, I don't, I don't know. There's a certain, um, there's a certain human uh, vulnerability, uh, like a, a comment on the fragile nature of existence that I find in all of David's films. And I think that there's a kind of very fragile way that I want to play the violin parts to echo that, what I'm seeing and feeling on screen. And um, I don't know, I could, I could tell other people to do it, but I don't know if it would always be as absolutely fragile as I play it because the way that I'm playing it would not necessarily be uh, something that you would be trained to do in school um, or would not perhaps be uh, technically, uh, it might be frowned upon a little bit because it's not the most uh, proficient kind of playing. It's rather- or polished. R yeah, not, not as polished, more rustic. Um, so that's part of the reason that just saves me the time of having to explain myself to other people. I think it's it's a part of what has distinguished your collaboration from you know, Hollywood films, which tend to kind of have slick, uh, you know, almost computer, <laughs> computerish scores. Even when you have 90 human beings performing them, they kind of, it, it becomes just a, a gallon of mayonnaise kind of spread across the movie at a certain point. And I think this is part of the whole myth and ordinary feeling because the music is gorgeous, it's emotional, it's, it's epic in a way, but it feels like a guy you know, playing it or, or clapping it. So it, your, your films end up feeling like, you know, something that's been carved out of wood. You might actually get a splinter off of it or something, but it's, it's not a slick product. It's, it's like a little folk. That's, I mean, that's a hundred percent what the, especially in these earlier films, the aesthetic, like I remember talking to Bradford Young, the cinematographer of this, and I was like, this whole movie should just look like it's a piece of wood. And, and the aesthetic carried through everything else. Love wood. And, and the violin on which I played all of the, I probably tracked myself, I don't know, 20 or 25 times or something. And, and I used the same violin because I only owned one violin at the time and I was broke. And, and uh, so I just played the same violin over and over again. And that violin that I used for the majority of the strings in this piece of music is one that I bought when I was uh, 18, not, oh no, no, 20, 20 years old. And so I had had it for 12 years at the time. And, and it was a violin that had not really ever been played by anyone else. It was a relatively new violin by an American luthier. And so it was a violin whose sound was developed by me, by my playing over the years that I had played it. And so even that aspect of it is very much a part of, of me and, and the, the things, the type of music that I chose to play on that violin um, for those 12 years affected the, the sound of it. And have you continued to use that violin on future scores? I did, yeah, like David refers to Pete's Dragon. I use, recorded the same violin um, for, for one of the violin solos in Pete's Dragon, and I still use it now. I do have another like, nicer violin that I bought a couple years ago, um, and I use them both. Daniel, I know your parents were church musicians, armed church musicians, um, yeah. so church was part of your growing up. Was church part of your growing up? My dad was a professor of moral theology okay so yes definitely because i pick up on churchy qualities in your films i mean the music to me has a a hymn-like quality sometimes but and i don't even know how to put it 
but sometimes it's not, and it's not literally when characters are going to church, uh, <laughs> but they feel like a country church sometimes, or an old English church sometimes, or a house church sometimes, or haunted house church, in the case of a ghost story. Um, but related to the mythical idea, this sense of like the sacred or the holy or uh, a meditative quality or something about it, uh, does that, are you conscious of a, of a religious a religiosity in your I'm filmmaking? I'm not conscious of it, but I'm aware of it. And I, I mean, I grew up going to like a Latin mass with Gregorian chant in a big old stone chapel. And, and that just like setting aside belief, there's something ancient and primal and, and, and sacred about that hearing that those sounds in that type of space that I think has lingered with me throughout, you know, my adulthood and I don't go to that church or any church anymore, but the, the aesthetics of that and the way those aesthetics push towards something more, uh, towards something, whether you want to call it, um, sacred or just, um, transcendent of some sort that does, that does reflect what I'm trying to do with my own movies, like taking the quotidian and trying to push past the membrane that, that binds them to some degree. Yeah, I, I grew up singing in my mother's church choir at the ch church where she was the music minister. And uh, that uh, this is like my earliest connection to music would be mostly through the church. So it's in my body whether I want it to be or not. <laughs> but the effect that can have is, is taking, like, it can lull you into a state or it can kind of connect it take you outside of yourself right you said transcendent so even if it's not attached to specific belief or philosophy that experience the kind of you know transcending the, yeah. the human i think you can have a spiritual experience entirely separate from spiritual belief and i don't think they're mutually um exclusive or inclusive so going back to that scene in that cue how did that cue how did writing that piece of music and then connecting it with the film sort of give you a, a, a map to the rest of the score if it did? I, I think the, the hand clap stuff, which I had wanted to carry over from the short film anyway, because it worked so successfully in the short film. I think that that really, uh, that's what, that was the key in for me. Well, that, that thing and then the, the thing with the banjo um, those were the keys in because I'm not, I'm not a banjo player and David had told me in our first conversations about the film before I started that he wanted to have banjo in the score. Um, so I was looking for ways to use a banjo that might be less traditional ways. Um, and that was, I stole this idea from Bon Iver. There's a song on the first Bon Iver album where they use the ebo on an acoustic guitar to make the same kind of buzzy sound. And I liked it better on the banjo because the head of the banjo is more resonant than the body of a guitar, um, or more easily, easily heard, the reverberations are more easily heard. Um, so those, those two aspects, and, and the hand claps, um, in my mind, I was making like a James Brown um, backbeat it's like a funk rhythm to me. Um, and I don't know why that felt like the right thing, but uh, that's what I tried and <laughs> it worked. So I, I left it. Is that, did I answer your question? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Asked and answered. So what did this, uh, this was not your first time working together, but it was kind of a, a pivotal experience. So what did this Ain't the Body Saints experience what did you take away from it as far as how you were going to use music in your films and how you communicate with Daniel? And did it, did it affect your aesthetic in terms of using music or how you conceived of that? It, it did. And, and it definitely, you know, I, like I mentioned earlier, I was editing the movie to the music and letting the music guide the edit to a, a large extent. And, and I got really comfortable doing that and, and, I really, from that point forward, you know, decided like I didn't ever want to like have 
the, you know, I didn't want to use temp score for a movie ever again. And I haven't stayed true to that necessarily, but I wanted to always deliver to Daniel a movie, a rough cut or an assembly that was free of music so that it could be, so that he could give something to the movie that it didn't already have in another form. And, and then the movie could respond to that in kind. You wanted to leave it flexible to, to the music. Yeah. And, and on, as a filmmaker, I also was like, let me get the movie as good as I can get it up to a point. Like obviously there are schedules that you have to hit and everything. So I can't like lock picture usually before giving you a cut, but I can get the movie to a really good place to where I feel comfortable saying like, this is a functioning movie. This is a good movie. And now when I, when we start talking about score, we're not looking at score as a band aid or a way to like pace it up or all the things that score can be used for in the gallon of mayonnaise version of, of writing a score that you talked about earlier and, um, and can look for ways in which the score can enrich and illuminate the movie that already exists. And you, do, you don't really give much verbal directions. Is that, I mean, is that fair? I don't think, I mean, like for that, for Ain't the Mighty Saints, I remember. I know I said I wanted some banjo in there, and we talked about the hand claps from Pioneer. And I think the only other thing I remember saying was, I was like, listen to the live version of this Joanna Newsom song called Only Skin that I was obsessed with that was a big influence on the movie as a whole. And there was something about the live, the way the band played that song live at a certain point in the song. I was like, there is something there that, this mo that feels like this movie. And I don't know if I ever gave anything beyond that. I don't think so. No, we, we talked at the beginning, and then I just started making music, and, um, and you gave me feedback on that, but there weren't a lot of other discussions, and you were working in New York, and I was in Dallas, so we weren't even in the same place to work on it together. And that's, a version of that has kind of persisted for every movie, where I'll have like some reference point or some idea, but it's very loose. It's like a color or a, yeah. a concept, but yeah. not, yeah. So then you're just reacting to the images and how you feel and obviously character yeah. and story as a, as a playwright. Yeah. yeah, and that's right. And speaking back to it or trying to speak from inside it. Uh, well, I, I often try to think of the music as a reaction to, to what's happening on screen. So yes, I am talking back to it in a way, but I hope it comes somewhat from inside it. I mean, I feel, a deep enough connection to David's films that it feels like it's inside of me. The film's inside of me in a way. Um, so there's something coming out from there and I want it to feel that way within the film as well. I know we, we talked about this with green Knight specifically, but music, it can do so many things, but it can be from an authorial omnipotent perspective or it can be from a character's perspective where it's a little more naive or limited in, in what it knows. Does that change from film to film or do you have a philosophy about, and this is so nerdy, but um, I'm, you're a nerd, you're, we're all nerds. <laughs> do you think about it in that sense of like, the music is outside and, and part of the authorship or is it coming from inside the house? <laughs> I mean, I feel like at least once I've talked about how the music needs to bubble up or rise yeah. to the surface. So I'm thinking about how I give, you know, notes or direction. I, it usually is coming internally. At the same time, I also always want everything to be bound up in a nice package. Um, and even though it never is, like I like I like my movies like rough and and uneven and and unwieldy. But at the same time, there is a degree to which like you need a cohesion. But I think you can get that from it rising from within but also we don't we don't talk in these terms when it's, we're when we're trying to time. <laughs> when we try to figure out what music needs to happen um in a film we, we're not uh we're thinking more from scene to scene and uh, talking in, in details about what's happening on screen or what what dialogue needs to be highlighted or avoided um and getting from one scene to the next things yeah, like that yeah yeah yeah. Rather than uh, the overall arc and the perspective. I think that the film tells us what, what perspective. And I feel like sometimes it changes within a film. Yes, definitely. From and I, I even remember, to like, internal. Um, with Old Man and the Gun, we 
finished the movie in like January, but it wasn't going to come out till October and watched again in yeah. August. And there was like one piece that we added and one piece we pulled back. I can't remember. I don't remember it's either. It's so long now, but just like, again, you like look at things like once you get outside of that sort of like macro perspective that you're in when you're working on it and just like see the um, step back and see the whole movie, you're like, oh yeah, like there's like a a cohesion that can be, you know, finessed and but in, when you're in the moment you're you're sort of i don't know i am like just like operating on that sense of narrative impulse that just pushes you forward pushes you forward pushes you forward yeah yeah it's instinct and you don't have some kind of master plan that yeah you're, some script that you're which part you know part of the aesthetic i think you established in this film that has carried through besides the kind of handmade textural quality of the score is this sense of um, narrative flow. It's often kind of elliptical and liquid, and it's not scene one, scene two. It's time is a looser concept, and there's this kind of, um, it's like a montage almost current. Yeah. And then the music obviously plays a role in that. And yesterday you said something about the, the cadence of the film or the musicality of the film. You think of film in terms of music or time, right? Definitely. Like there's like a sense of meter to to the, to the, to the storytelling and to the, the way the images are juxtaposed. That is to my eye and I guess ear very musical. And that is just the way I like to cut movies. And, it, you know, from working as an editor and cutting my own movies, I just kind of like developed a rhythm that makes sense to me and it feels right. And, um, and I've tried to work against it to see if I can push back. I think, uh, you know, every now and then I'll be like, can I, can I be more blunt and um, and sort of direct with the cutting as opposed to just li liquidity is the right word. Like, like I love this sense of these films being bodies of water that are flowing at one pace or another. And um, and I've never managed to really fully like dam those uh, those waters up. Don't do it. We, we want to drink from them. <laughs> Let's keep these metaphors going. Let's see how long we can keep this going. <laughs> but musically, that's a cool opportunity for you. I mean, yeah, yeah. Um, because, uh, you know, one of the hindrances of scoring for films is the hard edges. And this cue needs to go from minute one to minute two and 35 seconds. And it needs to hit these sync points. And it, so, it, you know, and great artists have been creative within those restrictions but when it's a little less um, hard edged and a little more liquid, the music can kind of um, flow. <laughs> I'm not trying to find puns, <laughs> but the music can can flow and 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 live a little bit more naturally, right? Yes, I I think that I care about these things more than David does. <laughs> I think that my natural tendency, perhaps because of the playwriting thing. Um, is to be more specific in the moments and to think about minute one to minute two and 35 seconds and to get it exactly and to mark when his eyes shift from the right to the left. Um, and I have to uh, stop myself from overdoing it because your films don't need it most of the time, I think. Sometimes they do, but yeah. Sometimes they, yeah. they do. But I think I, I over overcorrect on that aspect and then I have to pull it away to get the right thing. So after Ain't Them Body Saints, you do a Disney film with a computer generated dragon as, as one does. Of course. Um, and I know we can't delve too deeply into this one, but um, were there any lessons you took away from that experience as far as the use of music? Well, one of them was that recording with a full orchestra is for me as the director to just stand back and watch was such a joy. It was one of the greatest experiences I had as a filmmaker to date was just going and recording that score. And partially because I'd had no, Im I didn't have to do any work. <laughs> I just got to sit and watch basically a world-class orchestra play for like five days in a beautiful studio. And yeah. you know, like this is going into a movie we're making. This is incredible. <laughs> it, was. It, was, it was truly a beautiful experience. Yeah, it was. Were you worried about <laughs> losing um, a handmade author, you know, authorial kind of quality 
by by leveling up to a, a big studio movie like that? The, I mean, that worry was certainly there, and it's always going to be there when you're making a movie at a certain level. But I think, especially with that movie, there was like a very clear understanding on everyone's part of what the film was, and so I, you know, had a when I went in to present how I was going to direct it, I had a lookbook. And if you look at that lookbook now, it's like, oh, there's that's the movie. Like it never changed. And the 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 first cut we turned in was a little bit longer than the finished movie, but it's still pretty much the same movie. And I think there was a moment of clarity um, in the editorial process where everyone realized that the sound of the movie needed to be exactly that. That a slick, you know, traditional Hollywood score nothing wrong with those but for this movie it wouldn't have worked and and so everyone was very excited about those textures uh coming to define the the, the movie that we were all making there's a lot of wood in that movie too there's a lot of trees <laughs> a lot of trees in that film yeah you need another wood sea score um so from there you go to texas back to texas and make a little masterpiece called a ghost story which i could spend an hour and 45 minutes preaching a passionate sermon about longer a than ghost the movie story. itself. <laughs> I could do it. I, I would take the challenge. I will refrain. Just suffice to say that it is in the little panel of favorites on my letterbox account. Um, I know there was a little bit of finding the score in this one. It maybe didn't just flow naturally. So, um, well, let's watch a clip from ghost story and then we can discuss the finding of the score. So we don't even need to set this up. I think um, Rooney, the car Rooney is driving is the same car that Toby drove me to meet with Daniel. Wow. <laughs> is that true? It is, yeah. Whoa. That's amazing. I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, that was like the final final days of Old Blue. Wow. <laughs> that movie is holy to me. Uh, and not, not just to me. I think you you built kind of a holy experience. But even though it's just a dude and a sheet in a house who barely leaves the house, it's like Mozart's Requiem or something. And I mean... The two of you t c together build that, and I know many other people, but... Um, I haven't seen that in six years, so that, that was lovely to see. I really, I'll bet. I was like, I, was, I liked it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not bad. Um, so I did you have a color in mind or a, a song or any kind of like jumping off point for the score for this one? Indeed. I mean, it was Daniel's song that... Um, was the first piece of music that the film had. And it was before we started shooting his song. I got overwhelmed with something that we were working on Pete's Dragon at the time and he played it for me. And I was already, I'd written the first draft of a ghost story and it was just like, this sounds like the movie I'm seeing in my head and asked if we could use it. And that sort of was the seed around which the rest of the music grew or from which the rest of the music grew although on, on the surface stylistically the song is very different from the score at least you know instrumentation wise and emotionally so, it's emotionally it's yeah so was that helpful for you as the, using that song as a a starting point for the score it's always good to have some kind of jumping off point or some point of reference something to anchor it to start with some kind of limitation because otherwise I could just do anything and try a million different ideas before I happened upon one that belonged to the film, but he already had an idea like this feels like the film to me. And so I was like, well, great. That makes my job that much easier. But also apart from the song itself, the, this is probably the easiest time I've ever had scoring a film. So you found it pretty easily? Yeah, yeah, I I uh, think I've said this a million times by now, so I'm sorry for repeating <laughs> myself, but I think 80% of the score is the first, is V1, the first draft. And a piece like that, at this point, I can't remember if that, how locked that sequence was, if you were scoring to those beats, or if I recut it after you sent me the, I know that piece of music was like something you sent me, and I remember 
the very vividly the first time I watched it while looking at Rooney's face as she's driving away and just being like, I would never have dreamed of having this sort of like waltz-ish time signature. And yet I was so incredibly moved by it. And I can't remember now if I cut the sequence to that music or if you had scored it, but it was again, just like clicked right in. Yeah, this was about halfway through the film and I wrote this um, apart from the song. I wrote the score chronologically for the film, so I'd already written about half of the score, and and we were really happy with where it was going up to that point. But when I turned this into David, this piece of music, uh, he asked me to go back and <laughs> add it, <laughs> add the <laughs> add the that very simple melody into other cues, so that it would feel more cohesive, so, so that it would build up to this moment, this particular moment. Um, There's so much blank space in this movie there's so little dialogue it's it's a faceless main character standing not moving even that much so on one hand that seems like a wonderful p opportunity for music because there's nothing competing with it but it also seems kind of terrifying like where do you even start how how much music should there be how much how extroverted and big should it be but it, you make it sound like it was sort of just instinctive that it needed to be this big and move at this pace and feel this way i think so why i think um uh, for a film like this uh, the scene that you watch there's no dialogue um and the film does have some dialogue but not not much and that's true uh, of many of david's films long sequences without dialogue and that is a dream for a composer i think to be to be able to showcase something important to say musically related to the rest of the film. And I think part of the ease for me comes from um, being a violinist because the violin is such a melodic instrument and it's, um, you know, violinists have big egos because so many violin concertos have been written and how many viola concertos <laughs> have been written <laughs> none so and so they think of them, themselves as very important and like the concert master of the orchestra as the violinist so i think it's built in to the first instrument that i ever learned how to play that music is important and it can be at, at the front and stand out and uh, i guess i'm just lucky that you like it when yeah. the music does that sometimes. Definitely. <laughs> Why do you like that? I mean, what what shaped your own um, sensibility about that, or what gives you faith to let the music be that grand and poetic? And I guess it's just that it moves me, and it and it and it and it, and it, it functions in in hand in hand with the lockstep with the picture and they and they have the have mutual musicality to them that um never feels like it's oppressive or overbearing and if it does that's when we make adjustments yeah. i mean that's certainly happened yeah, yeah. so music can be big without being overbearing i guess we've just learned this i think <laughs> yes. i think so. i hope so i yeah. think so I, I but i think so yeah i mean it certainly isn't i i remember making Saint Nick and thinking like, you know, Darden Brothers, Simon Lang, all these, you know, filmmakers who use no music was like what this was going to be in a certain point, realizing, no, there's needs to be something here. What is that? And, and learning to not be afraid of courting the emotion that music can provide while also being wary of when it can be guiding a hand or guiding an emotion to too thoroughly um but even then sometimes that's okay like sometimes then it's okay to to give that little nudge was there a movie you saw growing up or in a formative time that gave you that kind of like i get overwhelmed experience that's a good a good question i think like when i was 18 the john bryan score to magnolia was like definitely one of those things where I just was like, I'm feeling all the feelings right now listening to this. And I still yeah. do when I watch it. I love that score. But that was like a, a big one in terms of like finding, you know, prior to then I loved, I had lots of collected soundtracks. It was 
obsessively bought them on CDs as soon as I like, had a high school job. But like that movie really, um, like the operaticness of that and yet its intimacy, like having like a scene of like two characters, one of them who's on their deathbed and the music's doing what it's doing. It's that really was a, was a, was a big deal to me. Um, and there's a lot of others as well, but I feel like that one hitting at that point at that age was just sort of like the, the bee's knees. And that's a movie that flows like a river too. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. And we've never talked about this, but, uh, before you answered Magnolia, I was going to talk about Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, also John Bryan. And I think this piece of music that we just heard is probably the most John Bryan piece of music that yeah. I've written for any of your it's films. Definitely true. <laughs> yeah. So there's something about what he did in Magnolia and Eternal Sunshine that has all the feelings in it. All the feelings. Yeah. Well, it pains me to move on from a ghost story, but we will. Not that the next ones are painful, but we just want to stay in that place. Um, but the next one was The Old Man and the Gun, um, which was such a surprising follow-up, and yet you'd moved from Ain't Them Body Saints to Pete's Dragon, so there's really no surprise is unsurprising or what, mm -hmm. vice versa with you guys. Um, but why did you make that film? I mean, what was the impetus for Old Man and the Gun? Robert Redford asked me if I would, so I was like, Yes, sir. Um, it, that's really what it was, and it, it was weird. It was a, it was ain't the party of saints. It just played at Sundance, and and I got some meetings set up, and one of them was at Disney for Pete's Dragon, and one of them was with Robert Redford for Old Man the Gun, which was a project he'd been wanting to make for a really long time, um, for at least ten years at that point, and and I met Disney in the morning and Robert Redford in the afternoon, and then got a call later that day that they both wanted to move forward on these projects. So they were kind of like hand in hand. I keep saying hand in hand. Uh, and that's why Robert Redford wound up in Pete's Dragon because that one happened first. And I was like, would you, I know we're going to delay Old Man the Gun, but would you be interested in coming to be in this movie uh, with the CG dragon? But um, but it, it was, that one was really interesting because it was, you know, Ain't the Body Saints is set in Texas and has, robberies and guns and things like that but it's not really a crime movie by any means and the old man the gun was and it's based on a true story and i realized in the course of adapting it and researching it and then making it that i am no good at true stories <laughs> and and the old the movie we ultimately made was was a pretty far cry from the truth but a real deep dive into a particular vibe and that's what I felt I could give and I felt I could treat it again like a bedtime story or like a fairy tale and find something that spoke to me in it um, and also it was really important to me to, to honor Bob's wishes like what he wanted the movie to be as well and finding that common ground like when when I knew that he was happy with it I was so gratified because I was like that was my biggest challenge to myself was to make sure that I was making a movie he was proud of because it was such a p passion project for him so did he have ideas for the music? Mm, I don't, I think he saw it with the music and was okay. like, love this movie. This is great. I remember when he called me that like best voicemail I've ever gotten was like him just saying like, and we didn't show it to him until it was almost done. Cause I just wanted him to like see the whole package and he, he loved it. And it was, uh, it was just what a, what a great day that was. Let's watch a clip from old man and the gun and then we can unpack the score a little bit. That was the first, very first scene we shot for the movie. Really? Yeah, it was like a pre-shoot day. Wow. Um, so from James Brown hand claps to uh, John Bryan to jazz. Yep. A little alliteration there. Uh, well done. Thank you. David, what did you think when you got the, the text, the proverbial text saying jazz? I think it came in the form of an wave file <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and i was like whoa awesome i think this one the only thing i said was like i feel like there's got to be a percussion in this score in yeah. a way that our scores have not had yeah and that's probably all i said i, I think i, I think I so probably yeah, I threw I out a couple of other random ideas um but that was the main one i remember is just like having percussion i was determined to make a jazz score 
I had been wanting to make a jazz score for a long time for before this, and I saw my perfect e- excuse to, <laughs> to do it. And, and I remember telling David this, that I wanted it to be a jazz score, and he said, well, that will make Robert Redford very happy. Yeah, that's true. So, uh, that, that sounded like a blessing to me. And then I immediately made several demos of of like short jazz pieces and this was one of the first ones they all ended up uh, all except one maybe ended up in the film one of them is the main theme and and this this was one of the first demos that i made i think it was before i'd seen i visited the set for a couple of days um, but before you had sent me a cut because you were just at the beginning of editing and i sent these demos you have said that you felt like Robert Redford is jazz in a way. Yeah, absolutely. You see the way he moves, and, and it just uh, he's got a shuffle in his in his step, and um, especially this character, he's so mischievous, and um, perhaps in this particular case, walking into a jewelry <laughs> store and then walking out without uh, paying for it is um, un- unpredictable, unexpected that a man in his 80s would uh, shoplift. But delightful. So delightful, yeah. A charming <laughs> a charming thief, a Lupin. And handsome to boot. Yeah. Um, you said you wanted, you know, it was hard for you to tell a true story, but you wanted it to have a certain vibe or that you felt a certain vibe. I can't remember how you put it, but what was the vibe of this film for you? Just fun. We just want, it was just like, I wanted the whole movie just to be a smile. I want it to be really gentle and fun and delightful. Um, I always described it as like sort of like a dirigible. Like it should be like very lightweight and just sort of float away when it's done, but have like just leave everyone feeling pretty, pretty happy with life. But so not the Hindenburg. Precisely. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a very breezy, feel good vibe. So was, was the creation of the score breezy, feel good? Yeah, the, we had an easy time with this one as well. Uh, again, like the first demos that I turned in all ended up in the film. Um, I had some particular friends in mind that I wanted to... The core of the music is a jazz piano trio, so piano, bass, and drums, and I had some people in mind in Texas that I wanted to do those. Um, unlike the other two that we've watched so far, I don't think that I played any of that. Mm. Um, that was all other people. We had a small string section and jazz trio, solo saxophone. and I, d- I did play lots of stuff on other parts of the score, but not on that particular piece of music. So in theory, you'd be sort of outside your comfort zone, but you're so comfortable. It's such a comfortable score. Yeah, well, I, I played so much jazz in my 20s, especially like playing in restaurants um, while people ate their dinner playing jazz standards um, and I really missed it because I hadn't at this point I hadn't done that for several years and so I, as soon as I started writing this music I felt very comfortable like I was doing something that I really wanted to be doing and the people that I was working with the people that I trusted and and such incredible musicians um, and I was there producing it so it, all, it still felt like it was coming from me and uh, um, really couldn't have gone better Playing jazz music while people are eating dinner seems like a good metaphor for being a film composer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everyone is focused on their meal and no one's yeah, listening yeah. to the music. It was another part Dankless. of my... Every now and then someone like, everyone's like, puts their fork down like, yeah, hmm, <laughs> pretty nice. <laughs> anyway, as I was saying, still, someone's got to do it. Yeah, um, more training for me. Um, well, just... For time's sake, I know we need to move on to The Green Knight, your most recent uh, film together. Uh, long in the process. Um, I know it was in gestation for quite a while. Was music something that was... I know it's we're going in a time machine here, yeah. but was music something you were kind of already thinking of when you were writing the script or conceiving of the film? Definitely. and, and I mean, I didn't know exactly what it was going to be, but I knew... Like, I was sort of, like, trying to define for myself the degree to which it could be anachronistic. Like, it was never going to be a, um, a you know, pop song, uh, medieval movie, or straight-up, like, electronic techno, you know, stuff. But it was 
we weren't going to go, you know, in that direction, but I didn't, I knew there was room, there needed to be room for anachronism. So it was sort of just like, kind of like not it was sort of just like building the corridor into my brain uh, that that would be part of it. And there was other, there, there was like, I say no pop songs. There was like a, a, um, attempt, not an attempt, but like at one point I was like, there's a sequence in the movie. I was like, I know there's going to need to be a song here. And I had this notion that there's this PJ Harvey song that would work. And so that was like kind of floating around there. But it, I also kind of knew that it wouldn't. And once we had cut the movie together, it was very clear that that song didn't work, but it, it did tell me that like, okay, we need a song, but it needs to, it needs to balance the, like straddle the line between modernity and, and, and medievalism. And, and that's kind of like what I kind of felt like the whole score was going to need to be. But, but in truth, like the gestation period for, script to finishing of production was a year so that wasn't long at all like within you know a year of having the idea to make this movie to write it we were shooting it and then two months after that we wrapped and then the journey to release was that was where the gestation all occurred i would say let's not talk about that but we kind of have to but it was good there it was, was a, a good bit of a pandemic in there yeah there there were I mean, the pandemic wasn't good, but it was good that we had like that we actually were able to let it become what it became, because um, sometimes, as we've learned, you just need a little bit more time, not just with music, but with the film in general. We have two clips. Well, it's the same clip, um, but this is a exciting, rare opportunity to see a first attempt at scoring a scene or the yeah. f the first one of the first attempts. And then a re a reconception of it. So should we watch them straight back to back, or should we break take a break in between? Uh, let's uh, let's take a break and 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 yeah, let's take a break. All right. So let's watch the first Green Knight clip, and then we'll discuss it. scene so what was the what was your concept for the cue there what were you telling us with the score yeah i wanted to i mean as you can see in this scene garwin our protagonist meets a bunch of giants in the wilderness and i thought well there's never going to be a bigger scene in any film that i've ever worked on than one that has giants in it so i thought a scene with giants needed like really big music like it should feel so very epic and I tried to make something in this demo that felt like epic medieval fantasy music to me. But it didn't really work 100%. And I knew this, like I I made the whole demo and I watched it back and I thought, hmm, I really want this, I really want this to work. I sh it should work. I, I feel like it makes sense on paper. It looks like the right thing. Um, but there's some something is like missing, so I sent it to David because I thought he would know what the missing thing was. Is it fair to say that you're you're sort of communicating the character's reaction to the giants, his fear in that moment? I think there's some of that, um, but and but just maybe uh, bewilderment in mm -hmm. the anticipation, like your the score is building as he climbs. Yeah, very literal. So David, when you get a cue back and you put it against picture, is it like immediately obvious that it's not quite right or that it's working? I mean, in this case, do you remember what your response was? I'll usually like try to convince myself that it's perfect because I love when things work perfectly. And then I, th I think this one was pretty quickly. Like I was like, no, this isn't quite right. And and this kind of almost goes back to that sen that sense of perspective that we don't often employ, but. I think like, watching this again now, like I haven't looked at that demo in like three years, but I remember the note I gave back was like, there, it needs to be beautiful. Like there need, like these giants are, are, are beautiful creatures. And there's not a, like the sense of, um, awe that we feel should have a, a real reverence to it as opposed to sort of like this, um, more anticipatory like build up that it that, that I had that, that, that was sort of like it was building towards a climax of some sort. It was like it doesn't need to build towards a climax. It just needs to be I mean it does because of what their giants are doing, but there needs to be a sense of of true majesty there. And 
it's not Gawain's perspective, the music. Like if, if we were to break it down that way, like mm-hmm. the ultimate, the final piece, which we'll listen to in a second, isn't from his perspective because he certainly wouldn't be feeling that. It is, it's, and it's not from the giant's perspective, but it's perhaps my perspective i think i think it, i mean that's and then you could call that the movie but like it's like it's like i'm i'm watching that scene and just seeing like the most beautiful creatures that have ever walked the planet and i want the music to reflect that now is that a note you wouldn't have known to give ahead of yeah. time so you it, it took you hearing a different uh, approach to know in your mind what what the feeling should be there. I mean, perhaps if I was working with someone else, I would have to develop the facilities and to to define those things ahead of time. But the way that we've been working has afforded me the opportunity to sort of discover it as we go, which is a luxury. Um, and you know, as evidenced by what we've looked at up to now, ninety percent of the time, it's like great put it in the movie and then every now and then there's like let's go back and and rethink this it's like you have a you use your director brain and then you turn it over to your musical brain and usually they're in sync with each other yeah yeah, exactly so (laughs) well let's watch that same clip with the final version of the music it's a longer clip this time because the piece of music that ended up here starts sooner in the film but eventually (laughs) eventually we'll get back to the giants (laughs) So, Daniel, when David said it should be beauty, it should be uh, reverent awe or reverent fear, did you just think, I got it. I know, I know what it should be. No, no. He, he suggested that we try doing a song okay. there because the score wasn't working. I mean, the, the terms that he used really helped me to understand what was happening because he said something like, over and over again, as I'm working on this film... It keeps rejecting all the things that I think that it should be, the things that I expect it to be, this grand medieval fantasy story. And so as a director, I keep trying, as an, as an editor, I keep trying these things that I expect will work, and then they don't work because the film rejects them. And so that put it into a perspective for me, like, yes, exactly, the film doesn't want us to make this thing that we think that it should be, which is great to be told that, like, get rid of your expectations, let go of them, and and perhaps then you'll find the the actual thing that you're looking for. And and so and then after that, David said, why don't we try a song here instead, just to like switch it up to go in the complete opposite direction, to not even think about hitting the beats. Like in my mind, the cut where it goes to the rock and then Garwin puts his hand on the rock as he's climbing up. I thought, I, was like, just, I really have to hit that moment with some kind of musical accent. And, um, and then it does not happen in this song. So I had to let go of those kinds of ideas. Um, and, and it is very easy to let go of that in writing a song because the song itself requires its own format and its own structure and it's not... Um, going to necessarily bend to the exact timings of things happening on camera. So it it freed me to make something new and to think outside of the way that I'd already been thinking about this scene. There is so much we could say about Green Knight, but I do want to leave a little room for questions from the audience before we introduce the companion. So a nice little taste of uh, (laughs) talking about that score. So um, before we have the world premiere of, of, the, of the next film, are there any questions that you have for these two gentlemen? Might be too dark to see hands, but. Right. The opening of the venue and the rock is um, bringing in the song as well. Um, oh. um, there was a Blues Runs game from Jackson C. Frank, and I was wondering how that ended up in the film. That was in the script, actually. Like that, through all of the many iterations of the script, that was a song that I just always felt like defined the movie in a large way to me. And so I always like from the very beginning when we were telling this, the financial years and telling searchlights like we're gonna license. That's part of the budget licensing 
Blues run the game and big Jackson C. Frank fan and was really a, just like knew that that had to be in the movie. And so that's where that, that's where that came from. I was always, that was always in that part of the movie, in that part we were shooting that sequence, knowing that song would go there. Right. Thanks. Very shy crowd. I guess I asked them all. I also <laughs> have to say that the audience is getting the cool microphone. I know. The big, <laughs> I want to be holding the, the big the orange cube. box. Hi. I like uh, the way you work together. Um, it seems like a natural partnership, um, a friendship, really. Uh, seems like a cut-up Siamese twin, in fact. Uh, you, you really belong to each other to make these movies. But... Um, David, did you ever thought about using another composer for your films, or did you already do that? And and how would this uh, jeopardize your relationship or friendship, if you would? I'm not prepared to go there today. You're now on the therapist couch. <laughs> <laughs> this no, is Oprah. No, I've, I've never, I've never, like, wanted to go elsewhere. There, there was a point where, you know, making my first studio movie where there wasn't, like, direct approval to bring Daniel on board. And so I had to consider that and, and go down that road to a certain extent. And it wasn't, I was like, I don't like this. <laughs> so it was definitely a relief when it worked out that Daniel, they, they, they approved Daniel to do it. And, um, and then realized like, oh yeah, like we should not break this up. Um, I think it was another great example actually of the film rejecting someone else's idea of what it should be. Yeah, that was right. absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember like our, our music editor who we still work with today, like being like, all right, you've, you know, let this is your first studio movie. Let's put in some temp music from Pirates of the Maleficent. That's what it, I think was, Maleficent's a good score. But like, it, just the movie was like, nope, <laughs> nope, get that out of here. <laughs> so how do you feel about Daniel's infidelity of working with other directors? It's awesome, because I get to hear more of his music. Good answer. <laughs> Trick question. Anyone else want to hold the big orange box? <laughs> we go whenever you're in the one. Hello, hello, both of you. Um, I wonder, David, um, how you picked up or, or how you think about Daniel to have him as a composer when you hear him first playing in a band. Then I think more about music like let's say some pop song or maybe something jazzy, something maybe with ambient influences, but what makes you think this guy could make my music, could be a composer for film? I mean, part of it was the first piece of music he sent me, which worked. And so I was like, okay, that that is evidence that this, but you know, think, think back to that now, that was like a very simple, piece of music compared to everything else. But yeah. when I was very young, um, I was, Tim Burton was my favorite filmmaker. And I remember him talking about how he just listened to Oingo Boingo and was like, that guy needs to score a movie. And I think it was very similar to that, where it was just like, I was like, I heard what you were doing musically in your band. It was like, well, that's cinematic. It'll work. Like there's not, it's not going to be, like at that point, I didn't even know like how much music you had studied. I didn't know your background, but I was like, oh, well, this sounds like music to a movie. So naturally it's gonna work out fine. Do one more over here. Hey, Andy. Yeah, Strange Angel. It, it also has some extraordinarily good underscoring in it. Some of the best I've seen in so-called prestige TV since the uh, renaissance of television. So tell us some tales about that. Uh, first of all, David, what drew you to that character? Well, I, I, had, I had always thought Jack Parsons was a really cool historical character and anyone who doesn't know who he is wikipedia is well worth reading and so the script i, I hadn't really like ever thought about doing a television series and 
the script got sent to me and I was like, oh, I like Jack Parsons. This is cool. I should. And so I, I, I signed on to do the, the first episode and then quickly tried to surround myself <laughs> with, with collaborators that I knew. Um, and then I, uh, I jumped ship and left them all behind. <laughs> I did the first episode, and then every, Andrew Palermo, who shot Green Knight and, and Ghost Story, shot a large chunk of the first season. I think you worked on it for, for two seasons. Two seasons, yeah. Um, but that, it was really just like, I was like, I should try seeing what working in episodic, the episodic storytelling format's like. I'd never done it. I'd never directed anything that I hadn't written before. And, and I was just intrigued by the process and, um, and agree, like, there's some absolutely incredible music in that series well for sake of time we need to get to our you know big event here um do you want to set this uh, film up tell us the name of it and why you made it yeah the um like we made it in like we shot it in july in, in over three days in july and we're going to be putting out a, a special edition green knight blu-ray that we just didn't have time. We were working on an, uh, on another movie. We were um, uh, Peter Pan and Wendy when Green Knight opened last two years ago. How, whenever, last, whenever it opened. Last year. Last year. Yeah. Um, and and so we didn't have time to put together like a good Blu-ray. And I, I'm a fan of physical media. And so I was like, okay, let's do a, let's do a better one or a special edition. And there's no like longer cut or anything. But what I was like, what would be cool is to put another movie on there. And so I adapted another Arthurian legend, and and we put it together very, very. We shot it um, in July, finished it probably like three weeks ago. Yeah. Um, I don't know how you managed to write the score, given <laughs> what was happening a month ago with all the different projects you were working on. Yeah, I wrote the score in uh, six days, maybe. But it's a short film. It's yeah. not. So it's, it's, it's not Herculean or it's anything. It's twenty minutes long, and we just finished it, and no one has seen it. No one has seen no it. No one has seen this except for the folks who made it. Two of whom are sitting right here, and um, so if there's any problems with it, uh, <laughs> or if the file's corrupted, <laughs> I don't even know. I've <laughs> I've literally not seen it outside of like my editing system, and um, the uh, the change of pace here. Is that this is wall-to-wall -wall dialogue? There's it's um, foregoing the silence that I've <laughs> kind of employed in the past, and I just really, on the last two movies, really enjoyed shooting scenes with actors where they were talking at length. And I was like, I'm just going to write some movies that have a lot of dialogue in them now. <laughs> so this one is sort of a um, a test run for I think the feature that we're going to make next, which has also has a lot of dialogue in it and a lot of music in it, and the and the movie in and of itself, I think, is great. I'm really, really proud of what you guys are about to see. I hope you enjoy it. And yeah, you are literally the first people in the world to see it. So I, I hope you like it. And if you don't, it's too late. We can't fix it. <laughs> and the name is? It's called um, The Oak Thorn and the, and, or Oak Thorn, ah, tongue tied. Oak Thorn and the Old Rose of Love. I made you do it because I thought I was going to mess it up, but. I messed it up too. It was a bad gamble. Um, <laughs> thank you, David. Thank you, Daniel. Please enjoy this. Uh, amazing premiere. And Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thank you.